We here at Abundant Life, we are what we would call an equipping church. This isn't some big show where you come to see a person and you get all hyped up and that's it. No, we believe that the Bay, which has 10 million people and only two to 3% are Christian, and naturally not all those 10 million people can fit in our church. What we've got to have are an army of people who come to our church, who get what they need so that they can walk out into their society and all the spheres of their influence and be who God's called them to be. That's why our tagline here at Abundant Life is literally a better you for a better world. We make this promise, you hang in there with us, you'll be bettered, but not just so that you can be bettered, but you'll be bettered so that your neighbors can be bettered, your coworkers can be bettered, your families can be bettered, students in your classroom can be bettered. A better you for a better world. It's really great that um, everyone here is so diverse and comes from different backgrounds because I've never been to a church where um, there's so many different people all coming to unite for one thing and that's just really amazing to see. I joined a growth group a little over a year ago and I think it's been one of the uh, most life-changing things that has happened. Um, I went through a personally difficult time and just having basically a second family here in the Bay has been so necessary. I just, I've loved them and they have just loved on me and um, just I've felt the love of Jesus through them. I've been going to this church for a few years and but was more of a consumer for a while and now I'm, I'm really, really happy to be to say that I'm getting more involved in make, being more of a contributor, uh, being involved with the worship team and, and really trying to just contribute to, to this great community that we have here. Grace is something that, frankly, in, in my life, I've had a, a little bit of a hard time understanding. I think Pastor Brian has a book about that, that I've been working, working. Look at me, God, I, I need to do this, I need to do that to, in order to please you. But I am, I am pleasing to God because I am under his grace. And because I'm under his grace, then I want to be pleasing for him and serve him and honor him with my life. And being having your flesh and your and live in the spirit, sometimes I still fall into that. But God's grace, I'm learning as I get older, is greater. And just resting and abiding in that is what it really is about being a Christian. Going is part of me. I have to go. Um, and whether it's, you know, bringing something that I've learned to the youth group or whether... And so that's what our sound is and that's who we will continue to be. People who gather in worship from every nation and every tribe lifting up the name of Jesus. My prayer for Abundant Life is that we would become a house of prayer totally committed, totally submitted, and always seeking God's will, seeking his mind, and his way of life for us. This is ALCF. 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 ALCF. This is ALCF. This is Abundant Life. This is ALCF. Now, Father, that is our prayer today, that you would speak to our hearts. Father, that you would, you would impart your word into our lives today, that you would stitch your word into the very fabric of our lives today. And we stand ready to receive. So please, Lord God, would you give us ears to hear and the humility, Father God, to confess those areas in which we are falling short, and to lean on your grace, Father God, to walk in such a way that you get all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. Use me, Lord God, to, to encourage someone today, Father. Someone needs to be encouraged today. And use me in that end, Lord God, but ultimately change us. It is in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. 
Well, good morning, Abundant Life. Good to see you all this morning. Uh, again, let me just reiterate a couple things to you. Uh, some of you have been hanging out with us for a while. You want to uh, check under the hood, maybe a little bit more of our church. You want to know a little bit more about the vision, the values, the story of our church. You've come on a great Sunday. Uh, this is what we call, this is ALCF uh, kind of Sunday. This is our wonderful uh, opportunity for you to hear what our church is all about, what we are believing God for, uh, and what is in our u- unique DNA. Uh, Even if you didn't sign up, and thank you for the many of you who did, we want to encourage you. You can just drop in. We've got a great lunch prepared for you right after service. Someone said lunch. Yep, didn't stutter. Lunch. Uh, And you can meet me actually in the chapel. We'll get started uh, right about uh, about, uh, noon. Uh, Secondly, I want to also make mention uh, that uh, today is the first rehearsal for our Resurrection Sunday choir that's getting together. Uh, And so, yeah, I got one golf clap over here. Um, so we want to encourage you, uh, you all, you, you may not have a praise team voice. Uh, you may have a mass choir voice. And so we want to encourage you to get in on that. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful time. But no matter uh, whether or not you participate in that or whatever, let's just pray. And let's just uh, uh, pray that God fills this place up on Resurrection Sunday. And more importantly, that all kinds of people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Simple ask. Will, will you pray that? Simple prayer with me every day leading up to Easter. Please, if you're going to do that, would you just raise your hand? Yeah, 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 that's wonderful, it's wonderful. Uh, Some of you are very honest, and I appreciate that. Uh, But please join me. Join me in praying and praying towards that end. Also, want to want to call them out. One of our own, Ace Patterson dropped an album this week on iTunes. It's already third on iTunes, or at least it it was. I said, let me check this brother out before I make an announcement about his project. So you know, I was kind of bumping it, uh, loving it. But I'm 46, so I got three teenage boys. I said, y'all check it out. And they'll tell you the real deal. So they they downloaded it, came back. My 15-year-old said, this is actually good. I said, okay, I'll announce it. I'll announce it. So uh, it's Airplane Mode. Is that the name of it, Ace? By our own Ace Patterson. And uh, uplifting lyrics, great beats. Uh, there's no misogyny or none of that in it. Uh, if you want something to just listen to that's just going to uplift you, that is a great and wonderful project. If you have your Bibles, please meet me in Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. We've been making our way, if you're new with us, through the book of Daniel, gleaning lessons, pearls of wisdom on uh, the intersection of our walk with God, faith, and work. Pick me up. um, Let's just jump to verse 34 of Daniel chapter 4, and I'll just read right to the end. Here is the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, having been humbled by God. He now comes back, verse 34, he says these words, listen to it with me. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. (laughs) Make note of this phrase, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed, notice this name for God, the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, here it is again, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are right and his ways are just. Here it is. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Go ahead and put the image on the screen. Mike Tyson, one of the most prolific boxers of all time at the height of his powers, was, uh, was in an interview one time, and they asked him the question, what do you think of those who, uh, who, who, who have noticed your weaknesses, and they put together these strategies and plans, you know, these boxers do to try to step into the ring and exploit your weaknesses, and they got all these plans. One of my favorite quotes of all time, Mike Tyson says, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Here is Mike Tyson a few years later. It's February of 1990. Mike Tyson, who uh, at that time was arguably um, the greatest fighter of his time. In fact, uh, it was even being debated for a little bit whether or not he was even greater than Muhammad Ali. Uh, here it is, February of 1990. Mike Tyson and what he called kind of a warm-up fight because he was supposed to fight Evander Holyfield after this. Uh, signs up to fight a guy over in Japan by the name of Buster Douglas from Ohio, uh, Gary. And um, and here is here's Mike Tyson. Um, he's not even taking this fight seriously. He's so successful. He's got all these accolades. Uh, he doesn't even train. He parties. Doesn't even work out. In fact, his, um, his trainers, they were so confident that Tyson was going to make quick work of this guy. They didn't even bring the appropriate medical supplies to his corner. And this would prove problematic because he got beat down by Buster Douglas. So much so, I don't know if you saw the image, they actually had to uh, fill up a glove, a latex glove with ice to, to, to kind of suppress the injuries that Mike was accruing during the fight. Here is Mike, height of his success, doesn't take this fight seriously, and he gets beat down. And if you track with his career, this would just be a turning point that would send him into a downward trajectory where he would never again be the same. And the reason for it is, is because what Mike Tyson shows us is that oftentimes success can be a greater threat than failure. Because what success can do is it can give us a distorted vision of reality. And this distorted vision could cause pride to swell up in us. And nothing kills success faster than the weed of pride. I want to talk to you this morning about a universal struggle we all have. I want to come right into your house, walk right into your bedroom. Get right in your business today. It's going to get uncomfortable. But, 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 but I want to talk about something not just you have, but, but a problem we all have. It's the problem of pride. Daniel chapter 4 is one of the most stunning stories in all of the Bible. Here is Nebuchadnezzar. He is commander in chief of the world's most feared and revered empire. It's the empire of Babylon. Here he is. He has another dream. This dream disturbs him. Again, he calls the wise men. You should just lose that title by now. They, they can't interpret the dream. Yet again, Daniel comes in. Uh, Daniel tells him the dream. Here's the dream. Nebuchadnezzar dreams that there is a large tree that is so huge. All of the birds of the heavens uh, are nesting in its branches. All of the beasts of the field are, are, are finding rest and sustenance under its branches. Uh, and the interpretation is this tree represents Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. It is a vast empire. It, it is an empire that is having global success. And then all of a sudden, a watcher and one of the holy ones, these are angels, they come down and they chop this tree down to a stump. They don't totally remove it. They just chop it down to a stump. They bind it with a material of, of, of iron and metal so that it would be preserved. The kingdom's not going to be totally removed, but we've got to chop it down and send this individual away for a period of about seven years. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar's lost his mind. He woke up one day looking in the mirror singing, How Great Thou Art. 
He, he, he thought that his accomplishments was merely because he pulled up his bootstraps tighter, not realizing God gave him the boots. And so his pride killed him. At the height of his success, just like Mike Tyson, he gets cut down. I know where I am. I'm, I'm right here in the middle of the Bay Area. I'm talking to a room full of people who, not all of you, but many of you have accomplished very significant things. You've gone to wonderful schools. You've gotten the degrees. You've, many of you have transported in from back east. You've fallen in love with kale and gluten-free stuff. And Oh, we're going to lay hands right down here. We just heard from, from Ryan, working what many people would call the dream job. Hear me, God is not against your success. God wants you to be successful. But the, the challenge is navigating success without losing my mind and falling over into the abyss of pride and arrogance. Because nothing will turn success into failure fast enough than the insanity of pride. This morning, I want to give you, I want to begin on a down note. I, I, I want to give you three things, and it's not a comprehensive list, that make up the, the scaffold, the structure of pride. And then after that, I want to end on an upbeat note by giving us two things we must do to cultivate the flower of humility in our lives. Because the Bible is clear that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I believe if we really let this word sink into our spirits, it will give us a better marriage. Because the problem to all marriage is pride. I don't care how it's dressed up, the problem to every marriage is pride. It'll make you more effective at work. Ain't nothing worse than just being with some narcissistic, self-centered people who always find a way to turn the conversation back to them. Anybody know anybody like that, by the way? You sit next to one of them, probably. What is pride? In order to understand, here's Nebuchadnezzar. He's a man full of himself. He's a man who reeks of pride. You don't have to spend a lot of time in the book of Daniel to figure that out. In fact, it's right in the opening two verses of the book of Daniel. Look at it with me. In Daniel chapters one, chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, it says this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. That's interesting. The Lord gave, the Lord gave, the Lord gave. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, stop acting like you got the victory because you were smarter or, or, or you had the bigger army or you had the more resource. God gave it to you. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And watch this now. He brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. If you understand ancient warfare, you understand that back then they, they never saw um, a conflict between two nations as just being a clash between two nations. But they saw it as being a clash between the gods of those nations. So here's what Nebuchadnezzar does. He walks into the temple, the, the temple of God that was used to worship the one true God. And he takes the vessels that were used to worship Yahweh. He takes those vessels out of the house of the one true God and uses them in dedication and in honor to his false god. It is his way of shaking his fist in the face of God and saying, I am better than you. 
Then in chapter 2, God shows up. We've talked about this last week. In chapter 2, God shows up, gives him a dream. He's disturbed. In this dream, there's this image of the head of gold, which we would later on discover. That represents Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. The rest of the body is made up of different parts. The punchline to this uh, dream is, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, brace yourself. Your kingdom will not last forever. What does he do? One chapter later, chapter 3, he constructs an image, all of gold. It is him, again, shaking his fist in the very face of God, saying, my kingdom will last forever forever. Some of you are saying, well, thank you, pastor, for that history lesson. Uh, Yeah, I got a little bit of pride, but I'm not off the rails like that. The common denominator to all pride comes down to one word, control. We are all control freaks. We just like being in control. No, we don't consciously think this, but but we want to be sovereign over our own lives. I, I, I do what I want to do. I mean, I remember first getting married. I got, I got married a little, little, little later on. Well, today it's considered really young. I was 26 when I got married. I'd graduated from high school, college, grad school, and I had been used to handling money my way. Then I get married, and we merge accounts. And, and then all of a sudden, I, I got to start checking in about my money. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? I was making the paycheck before I met you, and I'm still making the same paycheck, and for some reason, I need to start checking in before I start going to the ATM to draw money out of my account? No, no, you're good. You're good. See the control there? I like calling the shots. So the problem with a lot of marriages is you got, you got two people who instead of moving into oneness are still functioning as if they're single. So pretty much what you're saying is I want the freedom of singlehood and the spoils of marriage. See the control? Or some of you are here today and you wouldn't call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ and you struggle with a question uh, the majority of the world struggles with and it is the question of why do good things happen to bad people? I mean, rather, rather, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why? Because we all kind of have this equation mentality that pretty much says do good things over here, get good outcomes over here. And we think by our equation we can control God. But all of a sudden, we get winded when God goes off script. Because you cannot squeeze the infinite sovereign God into your cute little moralistic equations. So wait a minute. He tithes and just got diagnosed with cancer? Wait a minute. She leads the women's Bible study but is struggling with infertility? Wait a minute. They have family devotions every night, but their kid is a quadriplegic having just gotten to a car accident? See the pride in actually getting angry with God because God hasn't gotten the text message that I've written the script to my life and I am the star, the director, and the producer, and God is kind of my personal executive assistant who helps me to pull off my best life now. We are all arrogant messes. Why are, why, why are we such worriers? Worry is paying interest on a bill that hadn't come yet. It's our frantic grasp for control. Why do you have a problem submitting to authority? 
Now, I knew you wouldn't say amen on that one. Why is it every time the boss points out an area of improvement, your whole life caves in? And you quit and say, ah, oh, these people tripping, let me find another job. Well, here you are two years later and five jobs later. But it's always the other person's fault. Don't you understand? We are all control freaks. We want life on our terms. <laughs> Second thing, the pride. I love it. Here's the dream. Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. He's this pagan king most powerful king of the most powerful empire of the then known world. It is a, um, I love it. It's a tree that, that's huge. It's massive. I mean, these redwoods have nothing on this tree. Its branches are everywhere. All the birds of the, of the world are flocking to its nest, and the beasts of the field are, 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 are under it. And watch, if you read Daniel 4, watch the language. This huge, massive tree, and, and it says, watch it now, that the watchers and the holy ones, these are angels, have to come down to see it. Ah, you missed it. Huge, massive tree. If we're standing under it, man, our minds are blown. But here are the angels up in heaven. I just imagine Gabriel Michael are standing there, and they're looking down. They're like, hey, man, is, is that something down there? And Gabriel's like, I, I can't really tell. Why don't we go down to take a better look? Do you not see the contradiction? Let me just stop right here. This one's for free. You're not as important as you think. What looks huge from earth's perspective is barely noticeable from heavens. I'm reminded of this all the time, man. I'll go preach somewhere and thousands of people coming. I got folk coming to pick me up from the airport and they done read my books and want me to sign their stuff and want me to sign their Bibles. I never signed Bibles. I didn't write it, but they want me to sign all this stuff. And, you know, they got my, the green room set up and they got my little snacks prepared for me. They give me a T-shirt, coffee mugs, and folk clap. And, you know, then I get on the plane. I come home. This is a true story. I walk in the house and Corey's like, how'd it go? I tell her, she's like, good. <clears throat> Take out the trash. <laughs> not impressed. Just not impressed. But honey, you should have seen they had all the green M&Ms. I just wanted green m and It was right there in the green room. Not impressed. Take out the trash. I don't care how successful you are. When you leave your job, your job will continue. It may even get better without you. When you die, when you die, I, look, I've just done a lot of funerals. When you die, maybe some people will come and maybe they'll even hop on airplanes and catch a flight to get there and they'll stand up and say some nice things. They'll never do it within a two-minute fr uh, time frame, which is what I always tell them. They'll just never do that. But, you know, they'll go on and on about you and they'll cry and they'll shed some tears. But guess what they're going to do next week? They're going back to work. You are not as important as you think you are. So here's Nebuchadnezzar. He gets cut down. He gets sent away. And look at what he says after the seven-year period, verse 34, and my reason returned to me. Look at verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned to me. What is pride? It's control. But secondly, all pride is temporary insanity. It's temporary insanity. 
It's, it's me losing my mind and thinking I'm God. That's what pride is. I'll never forget when my, uh, when, when, when my kid brother was about six or seven, he was first, second grade, whatever it is, and, and he came home from school one day, and Mama was sitting in the front room, and she said, my kid brother's name is Brendan. She says, hey, Brendan, I want you to go into the dining room. You got homework. Okay, good. Get your homework done. A couple minutes later, there's a, whole lot of, uh, there's a whole lot of noise coming out of the dining room. It's obvious my brother is doing everything but homework. My mama yells from the front room, hey, Brendan, I told you, do your homework, to which he responds, six, seven years of age, I ain't got to do what you say. Now, I know how, you know, some of y'all, these nouveau parents, so you would have a discussion with your kid about that and wanting to get inside his feelings and all that. I understand, I understand. I probably shouldn't say this in California, but it was in Georgia at the time. So mama got up from the sofa, made a beeline, and I loved it. When my brother saw my mama, his reason returned to him. Literally no embellishment. He says, oh, Lord, Jesus, help me. <laughs> Mama said, he going to help you all right. And I'm his instrument of help. <laughs> I won't tell you what happened next because I'm in California. But <laughs> it's insanity to think that you got what you got because you worked hard. It's insanity to think that your marriage is still together because you did some good things. It's insanity to think that your kids are walking with the Lord because of your technique. It's insanity. Had it not been for the Lord who was on our side. Nebuchadnezzar said, it took humility. It's, like, it's as if God said to Nebuchadnezzar, oh, okay, you're a human and you think you're God. So here's what I'll do. I'll drive you away like a beast until you realize you're but a human. I'm God. You're not. Third thing about pride, it's control. It's insanity. But here's the third thing. God sends Daniel. Daniel... Daniel comes to, to Nebuchadnezzar, and he gives him the interpretation of the dream. And then I love it. Round about verse 27, Daniel says, look, let me just, okay, I've given you interpretation. Let me just throw this out there for free. You didn't ask me for this. You're not paying me for this. A little word of advice. Humble yourself by walking in righteousness and holiness. For 12 months, Nebuchadnezzar does it. Then he wakes up one morning, the text tells us. Walks out, and here he is just walking out um, on the rooftop of his palace. And, and I can just see him now. He's kind of perusing the Babylonian skyline. And there he had to have seen the hanging guards of gardens of Babylon, which was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which he constructed, by the way, for his wife. His wife was from a mountainous region uh, there on the plain of Shinar. Uh, and so he constructs the hanging gardens of Babylon to give his wife a sense of home. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And boy, is he impressed. He continues to survey, and what does he see? The 53 temples that are dedicated to the pagan gods that, that, that he made sure were constructed. And boy, is he impressed. And then he looks down on the famous wall of Babylon, the thickest wall ever. We'll talk about it some next week. It was a wall so wide and so thick that you could line up four chariots side by side and race horses around the top of it without fear of them falling off. It was an impregnable city. And then he says these words to himself, having taken all of this in. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, look at, the, look at it with me. Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory not of God but of my majesty. Look at what I've done. Why wasn't that great man? I got into that school. I got the PhD. It's me pulling up to my house going, man, look, 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 look at what hard work does. 
It's me heartily looking down at a homeless person, kind of saying to my spirit, why can't they get it together? It's the same. It's the exact same. So we, we, we pay no, no, no sense of structural or systemic injustice. We have no empathy, no compassion towards, towards those who are struggling. In fact, we actually look, we need them to feel good about ourselves. It's the same. God is so nauseated, the text says, while the words were still on his lips. What is pride? It's, it's control. It's insanity. But thirdly, it is spiritual plagiarism. You know what plagiarism is, don't you? You've written papers in high school, college, grad school. You know how it works. Whenever you write these papers, you'll oftentimes insert a quote. You'll borrow, you'll borrow someone else's thought. The idea here is you need to insert a footnote, and that footnote says this is not my work. This is not my thought. This is not my statement. That footnote says I, I actually here's where I got it from, so let me cite my source. But plagiarism is taking someone else's work giving it credit to yourself without citing your source. Spiritual plagiarism is, is saying, look at what I've accomplished, not realizing that your whole life should be one big footnote that says, God is my source. Every word in the paper that is your life should, has a, should have a footnote that points back to God. The good parts, made it through school, footnote God. Got the job, footnote God. Got the kids, footnote God. And even the bad parts. Got the terminal illness. God's holding my mind together, footnote God. In a bad season right now, but where did I get the joy from, footnote God. Every word and sentence of your life should have a footnote that says, God, God, God. All right, let's turn a corner. The whole reason for this is God says, Nebuchadnezzar, I need to humble you. So how do we cultivate humility in our lives? The Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How do we cultivate that in our lives? Whether you're a basketball player, your call is to be humble. If you're a pastor, your call is to be humble. If you're a day laborer, your call is to be humble. If you're an executive, your call is to be humble. As husbands, I'm called to be humble. As a wife, the call is to be humble. As a single person, the call is to be humble. And the humble person is always looking to bring the best out of others. The humble person doesn't make excuses, doesn't point fingers. When something goes wrong, they look in the mirror. When something goes great, they look out the window and give praise other places. The number one killer to every relationship is pride. The number one killer to every church and every church split is pride. The, every, the number one killer to every friendship is pride. God calls us to be humble. I want to give you two things here in this text that will go well in cultivating humility. Again, I just want to go back and Daniel chapter 4, verse 27. Daniel says this, therefore, king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. But by the way, I hadn't planned on, this, on saying this. Uh, Daniel is modeling for us a trait of the humble person. One of the traits of the humble person, notice what Daniel's doing. He's looking the most powerful person in the eyes, and he's saying, listen, I love you too much not to tell you. I, I, I just got to give you some truth here. I, I know you're my boss. 
I heard about what you did to my three friends, throw them in the fiery furnace. You can do the same thing. You may get angry. You may not like this. But humble people speak truth. It's actually arrogant people who won't speak truth to people. Why? Because you're handcuffed by people pleasing. You want, you, you're more concerned with being accepted by them than by doing what's best for them. That's arrogant. So if, if you'll never say anything hard to somebody in love, you're not a real friend. And you're actually kind of arrogant. Because in that moment, you're looking out more for yourself than you are for them. Daniel says, I, I just got to tell you. And he gives him the word. How do I cultivate humility in my life? I bend myself under the word and authority of the word of God. Um, we've all heard this story. True story. A week ago, two weeks ago, I think it was. <laughs> God bless this dear woman. She's at the Arizona Zoo. And there's all these signs around. But she has to take a selfie with a jaguar. Have y'all heard this one? God bless her. She, she wanted to take a selfie with a jaguar. So she ignored the signs. She goes past the barrier, gets out her selfie stick. I think she sticks her arm through the barrier. The jaguar says, well, what do we have here? And the jaguar decides to go jaguar and grabs a hold of this one. Thankfully, uh, maybe it was her friend or, or someone else. They got to thinking real quick. They threw water at the jaguar, distract the jaguar. The jaguar let go. But this woman had to be carted off to the paramedics all because she ignored the signs and had to take a selfie with a jaguar. It's interesting, the Bible likens Satan not to a jaguar, but close. He says, be on guard against your enemy, the devil, who goes about as a roaring lion. Whenever we don't live under the truth of God's word, whenever we don't bend our lives, to the standard of God's word, it is like we are positioning ourselves to take a selfie with Satan. There's something about living within the barrier of the word of God. No, it doesn't totally inoculate us from problems, but there are some messes I think we can testify that you and I have gotten into that we shouldn't have gotten into because we ignored the word of God. And so for some of us, Maybe we're ignoring what God's saying about our finances. God says, listen, just give me the tithe. But we refuse to do so. We get into credit card debt. And we'll spend all kinds of money on trips to Hawaii and so on, but we won't give God his due. And Satan is wreaking havoc in our finances. Because we refuse to bend to the word of God. We're going to call the shots. Others of us, God says to me as a husband, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Love your wife, Brian, in the, in the ilk of Jesus Christ. Serve her. Look out for what's best for her. Cultivate her. Uh, d don't look at her as your administrative assistant who helps you to have your best kind of life. No, you be the chief executive officer of sacrifice in the marriage. Relinquish control. Submit to me. Serve her. 
And they said, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to put her in her place. I'm going to point out all her faults. I'm going to expect her to work 40 hours a week, cook my dinner, give me marital relations when I expect it, and do things my way. And then when I make up the bed once in 12 months, I'll brag about it. That ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. And you wonder why God ain't blessing your marriage. Because you ain't acting like a man. You're acting like a little boy who thinks you married a mama. What areas of your life are you not bending to the word of God? Let's go home on this. How do I cultivate humility in my life? Bend, submit to the word of God. Secondly and finally, (laughs) did you know Daniel chapter 4 is the only chapter in the Bible that God gives permission for a pagan to write? I just want you to think about that. The only chapter in Scripture where God says, I'm going to breathe on a non-Christian writing it. And notice with me, if you will, how Daniel 4 opens and closes. These are words not from a person who grew up in Sunday school, not from a seasoned believer, but from a person who scholars say is not a believer. Listen to what he says in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the most high, most high God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders, how his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Now look at how it ends. Verse 34, the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lift my eyes to heaven. My reason returned to me. I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. Why? For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? This chapter opens with praise, and it closes with praise. Why is praise important for me and my walk with God and humility? Why should praise be a regular rhythm in my life? Answer, because when I praise God, I put God in his proper place as most high and me in my proper place as not. Oh, that's why I really want to encourage you to get to church on time. I want to encourage you to get rid of this mentality that says, I'm just coming to church for the word. That is selfish. That is prideful. Why? Because worship is what we give God. The word is what he gives us. And if I only come for the word, here's what I'm saying. I just want you, God, to feed me, feed me, feed me, and I won't give to you your rightful due. If you want to go to war with pride in your life, praise him. Call him the most high. And I'm not just talking about going through the motions and mouthing songs. Mouthing songs aren't praise. It is singing with every fiber of your being to a God who woke you up this morning, as my grandmama used to say, and who started you on your way, who clothed you in your right mind, who put breath in your body. As long as you have strength, give him praise. Because praise says, God, you're sovereign. God, you're in control. And I love the name, I love the name, I love the name that he uses for God. He just doesn't use any old name. Notice he uses the name Most High. (laughs) The baddest king on the planet gets humbled, and when God gets through, he says, Most High. 
most high. You're high above my situation. You're high above my circumstance. You're high above my marriage. You're high above these tears that I'm shedding. You're high above this trial. You're high above all the problems that come my way. You're most high. God, you're most high. I just get lost in your presence. Oh, I grew up in a church. If you wanted to awaken the ire of Karen and Crawford Loritz as a child, call an adult by their first name. My parents didn't play that. They would always say, put a handle on it. That's Pastor Conley. That's Dr. Johnson. That's, that's Brother Ulysses. Yeah, that's actually his name, Ulysses. Put a handle on it. Why? They were saying, because when you do that, when you use appropriate titles, you're reminding yourself we're not peers. Don't you understand God is not your peer, friends? You, you, you struggling to figure out how you're going to pay these bills when God this morning put the sun, moon, and stars in their place. You're struggling to figure out how you can hold it together when, when Hebrews tells us that God holds the universe by the word of his power. And if God can hold the universe together, he can hold you together. He's most high. I thought we'd end, friends, on a note of praise, if you don't mind. Maybe some of you missed praise this morning corporately. But I want us to end by giving God his rightful due. I want us to leave by praising the wonderful name of Jesus. For his name is not just good. Take a page out of, the, of this pagan king. His name is a great name. And when you lift your eyes above your situation, when you lift your eyes above what you're going through and you get lost in that great name, you're reminded of the power of God, that he is a way maker, that he can see us through. So I want us to stand now, and I'm not trying to be your cheerleader. I'm not trying to force you to, to clap. I'm not trying to force you to sing as loud as possible. I, I, I just want you to give God his rightful due. For some of you, that, that may literally be just stretching your hands towards heaven and, and lifting your head up to God and singing as loud as you can. Others of you, that may, I'm reminded of an old mother in our church. She used to just sit. They had a row at our church called the Mother's Row. She used to just sit on the Mother's Row, and she would just, just grab her elbows, and she would just sway from side to side. And, and while everybody else was shouting, she was just saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She was lost in praise. So whatever your posture, give God his rightful due. Bible says if you don't, the rocks are going to cry out. Would you make up your mind that God ain't no rock going to take my place? Would you praise the great name of the Most High God?